Welcome to the Living Healthy Podcast, where you can improve your quality of life by making solid and informed decisions. I'm your host, Eddie Randall. Thank you for joining me for part two of this two-part podcast. As you know, March is officially Bleeding Disorder Awareness Month. I've decided to talk about the complex and fascinating subject of hematology. I'll pick up where I left off discussing one more type of anemia and then what we can do health-wise in regard to the many types of anemia. Then I'll discuss blood disorders and blood cancers. This is part two of Hematology. How can we live healthy with blood disorders? The last anemia that I'll talk about is red blood cell aplasia. Red blood cell aplasia is a very rare form of anemia. It occurs when there is a low reticulocyte count, which is just the number of the total red blood cells. Measuring your red blood cells is the classic way to determine if there's some type of disorder like anemia. Red blood cell aplasia can also be referred to as pure red cell aplasia, as it's an isolated decline in red blood cells, meaning it does not affect the white blood cells. It can be acquired by infection or through medications. Autoimmune disorders can also cause this to happen. An example of an autoimmune disorder that can lead to this condition can be collagen vascular disease, such as lupus, Uh, also rheumatoid arthritis. Cancers like leukemia, lymphoma, thymoma, breast cancer, and lung cancer are also thought to cause this condition. Viral infections are culprits as well. Congenital pure red cell aplasia is a condition that children are born with that's linked to a genetic abnormality that can result in organs forming inadequately. There's an article on VeryWellHealth.com by Dr. Ruth Jensen. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Ruth Jessen. What is pure red cell aplasia, PRCA, a rare type of aplastic anemia? She noted that organs like the heart can form improperly, resulting in malformation. Symptoms of red cell aplasia include lethargy, fatigue, headaches, pale complexion, joint pain, and stomach pain. Treatments usually include transfusions as well as treating the condition that caused PRCA in the first place. Anemia and what you can do. Most anemia disorders are inherited, so your best bet is to listen to your doctor and follow the treatment plan he or she has given to you. There are limited options that you can do in conjunction with that treatment plan. As always, discuss any approach you want to take with your doctor and decide what is right for you. Diet plays a big role, and if you are iron deficient, then iron-rich foods are your best bet. As I have mentioned some of them in the first part of the podcast. Leafy greens, like spinach, kale, and collard greens, are very good to use. What makes them beneficial is the vitamin B12 and folic acid content. Both folic acid and vitamin B12 help to make red blood cells. Red meat is also ideal for iron, such as Uh, excuse me, such red meat would include beef, veal, and mutton. Other meats, such as turkey, tuna, and codfish, are also good. While there is no particular exercise recommended for people with anemia, it's recommended that you continue to exercise, but on a level that will not cause excessive complications in relation to your disease. Even with anemia, you can still exercise, as you will build strong bones, muscle, lose weight, and strengthen your cardiovascular health. So I would encourage you to continue to exercise, but on a level that you can handle. Iron supplements are also encouraged in unison with dietary changes that can increase the iron in your body. Other blood disorders. There are a significant amount of blood disorders out there. And for simplicity, time, and the length of this podcast, um, as I did when discussing the different types of anemia, I'm going to touch on some of the more common types of blood disorders in this podcast. The difference is that anemia is more of a class of disorders, and this podcast will encompass other types of blood disorders. Hemophilia is the first blood disorder I'll discuss. 
To understand hemophilia, it's best to understand how blood clots in the normal process of a person that does not have hemophilia. Hemophilia occurs when a person has one or more of the clotting factors that is missing or damaged. There are 13 clotting factors designated by Roman numerals. They are fibrinogen, prothrombin, tissue thromboplastin, ionized calcium, libel factor, stable factor, antihemphilic factor, plasma thromboplastin component, stewart prower factor, plasma thromboplastin antecedent, Hagman factor, and fibrin stabilizing factor. I did not mention the sixth factor because it's unassigned and is part of another factor. The thing that happens is that the blood vessels will constrict to minimize blood loss. A platelet plug will form for small cuts, and if it's a deep cut, uh, gash, or wound, then a coagulation cascade will take place, which involves fibrin. Then the clot will contract and fibrinolysis occurs, destroying the clot as it's no longer needed. Hemophilia is a troublesome and debilitating disease that can literally change your outlook on life in regard to things you can do and can't do. I am a proponent of dictating your life and not allowing an illness to control you. In regard to hemophilia, you have to be very careful in the things that you do. For instance, a person with hemophilia would be best suited to avoid contact sports. Hemophilia is a disease where you can't heal cuts, bruises, or wounds properly. This is due to the body's defect in instructions for blood clotting. Hemophilia can cause those affected to bleed a lot longer than normal when suffering a cut or more serious injury. Most people are not particularly aware that they have the condition until they go for surgery or a dental procedure. Hemophilia A and hemophilia B are the most common types of this disorder. The Center for Disease Control states that most people commonly have either low levels of factor 8 or 9 clotting factors. Hemophilia A is a disorder in clotting factor 8. Hemophilia B is a disorder involving clotting factor 9. It's also known as the Christmas disease. It's called so as it's named after the first person diagnosed with this condition. This was back in 1952, and his name was Stephen Christmas. Common symptoms include bruising easily, unexplained nosebleeds, bleeding after a cut, hematuria, joint pain, and for women, heavy menstrual bleeding. Hemophilia is inherited and is an X-linked disorder as the genes for this disorder are strictly on the X chromosome. Hemophilia can also be acquired. As an example, the body can build up antibodies against factor VIII clotting factor and prevent proper clotting. Doctors are not exactly sure what causes this disorder. The most common treatment involves infusing clotting factors to aid in proper clotting. Hemophilia.org states that there are non-factor therapies, mi-cizumab, which is a prophylactic treatment. What it does is it mimics the way factor VIII behaves, thereby allowing a proper response to injury and bleeding. Von Willebrand's disease was coined after the Finnish doctor who discovered it back in the mid-1920s. It was discovered by Dr. Eric Adolf von Willebrand. This problem is due to an issue with the glycoprotein named VWF, or von Willebrand factor. This condition is the inability for a clot to form properly. This disorder is a form of hemophilia, and there are three main types. They are listed in the order from least to most severe, and the types are 1, 2, and 3. In type 1, people have low levels of VMF, and as in classic hemophilia, people with type 1 will usually have low levels of clotting factor 8. Bleeding can tend to be mild in type 1, in particular when it comes to injury or surgery, especially oral surgery. In type 2, there's an inadequacy in the VMF and it does not work correctly. There are four subtypes of type 2. They are 2A, 2B, 2M, and 2N. In 2A, the VMF is not the right size and therefore cannot do its job and cannot properly form a clot. In 2B, the timing is off 
and the VMF tries to attach at the wrong time in the clotting process. With 2M, the VMF does not attach to platelets the way that it should, but factor 8 sticks as it should. This in turn results in not being able to properly form a clot. Finally, in 2N, VMF attaches to, a, to platelets, but it does not attach to factor 8. Type 3 is the rarest and most severe variant of von Willebrand's disease. With this type of disease, the body does not create any VMF. So not only will the person have low levels of factor VIII, but they will not be able to form clots at all. Not only will bleeding be excessive, but a person can suffer internal bleeding very easily with this condition. Symptoms include bruising easily, having cuts and small injuries that you don't recall getting, as well as spontaneous nosebleeds, excessive bleeding, heavy menstruation, and excessive bleeding during natural childbirth. Von Willebrand's disease is an, is an inherited condition passed on from parents to children. Treatments include desmopressin, birth controls, antifibrinolytics, and replacement therapies. Desmopressin is a hormone which can induce the body to produce VMF. Cleveland Clinic states that desmopressin can either be injected or inhaled in the nose. For women, treatment can include birth, controls pill, birth control pills as this type of contraceptive will increase VMF. Antifibrinolytics can be used as they prevent fibrinolysis, thereby preventing the body from breaking down clots. Replacement therapy includes an infusion of blood clotting factors. Treatment all depends on the type of von Willebrand's disease that you have, as well as the level of trauma that the person has suffered. Thrombocytopenia. Now, thrombocytopenia occurs when you have a low platelet count. Your body does not have enough platelets to properly form clots to stop the bleeding. If you have this condition, you may experience spontaneous gum or nosebleeds. This condition is inherited, but can also be caused by bacterial infections, viral infections, and autoimmune diseases. When thrombocytopenia is inherited, it usually comes from a genetic mutation and is autosomal dominant, meaning you can get it just from one parent that has the mutation. Bacterial infections like Helicobacter pylori and severe bacterial infections like sepsis can also cause a condition. Viral infections like chickenpox, hepatitis C, and HIV, and cancers like lymphoma can also cause the disease. Autoimmune diseases such as lupus can also predispose a person to this condition. Symptoms include, as mentioned, spontaneous nose and gum bleeding, hematuria, fatigue, headaches, joint pain, heavy menstruation for women, and jaundice. It's commonly treated by simply treating the condition that caused the condition in the first place. DVT, also known as deep vein thrombosis, is a blood clot that forms deep in a vein. This happens mostly in the legs and can occur when you have a sedentary lifestyle or do not move for a period of time. Other factors that can cause a DVT include pregnancy, cancer, trauma to the body, inflammation, birth control pills, smoking, obesity, and people who have a history of blood clots. They are dangerous in that these clots can break off and travel to the lung and kill you. Mostly after surgery, some are not able to move or are told not to do so. This will allow recovery time from the procedure. When this happens, patients are often given compression stockings or compression sleeves that inflate and are hooked up to a small machine. Symptoms for DVTs include shortness of breath, chest pain, fainting, and pain and swelling in the affected area. Treatments include leg elevation, blood thinners, exercising, as well as surgery. Surgical procedures include getting an IVC filter. This filter allows blood to circumvent the clot. Prevention includes exercising and changing your diet. Eating ginger, turmeric, and cayenne pepper can really help. Ginger contains salicylate, which can thin blood naturally. Turmeric contains curcumin, which can act as an anticoagulant as well. As with ginger, cayenne pepper contains salicylate, 
and as mentioned, it helps to thin the blood. Raw garlic is also a great blood thinner, but it can have adverse reactions in regard to some medications, so make sure to speak to your doctor about this. A pulmonary embolism is the same as a DVT in the fact that it forms a blood clot. The difference with a pulmonary embolism, or PE, is that it forms in a blood vessel rather than in a vein. Then like a DVT, it has the ability to travel to the lung and can result in death. When it travels to the lung, it can block an artery in the lung. Symptoms of a PE include headaches, lightheadedness, sweating a lot, shortness of breath, coughing that results in bloody mucus, and chest pain. Pulmonary emboli can be a result of deep vein thrombosis. Some causes of a PE include birth control pills, obesity, genetics, having an inactive lifestyle, cancer, some medications, heart disease, and old age. Treatments include blood thinners, a vena cava filter, and clot removal. In addition, foods mentioned for DVTs can be utilized as treatment for PEs. Leukocytosis. Now this means that you have a high white blood cell count. Having a high white blood cell count is usually a sign of an infection that your body is trying to fight off. This is a natural and normal response of the immune system. There are five different types of leukocytosis. They are basophilia, eosinophilia, lymphocytosis, monocytosis, and neutrophilia. All five types are types of white blood cells, or WBCs, and they are an indication of the type of infection or inflammation involved. Basophilia can be a sign of chronic inflammation and allergies. Conditions that can lead to basophilia are food allergies, drug allergies, rheumatoid arthritis, and irritable bowel disease. Symptoms include fatigue, sneezing, itchy and watery eyes, shortness of breath, fever, diarrhea, unexplained weight loss, joint pain, and abdominal pain. Eosinophilia, or a high level of eosinophils, can be an indication of a bacterial or parasitic infection. Conditions that cause this are allergies, cancer, endocrine disorders, roundworm, ringworm, Crohn's disease, and drug interactions. Symptoms include diarrhea, rash, itching, fatigue, sneezing, and watery eyes. Lymphocytosis can be caused by leukemia, lymphoma, hepatitis, and other viral infections. Symptoms include liver inflammation, fever, fatigue, rashes, and enlarged lymph nodes. Monocytosis can be caused by Hodgkin's lymphoma, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and irritable bowel disease. Symptoms are pretty much the same as in lymphocytosis. Neutrophilia. Now, this can be caused by cancers like lymphoma, leukemia, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, vasculitis, and smoking. Symptoms are the same as in lymphocytosis and monocytosis. Treatments for leukocytosis include inhalers for breathing problems such as asthma, along with antihistamines for allergies. Anti-inflammatory medications will be prescribed for rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Antibiotics will be given to treat bacterial infections. Radiation and chemotherapy will be used to treat leukemia, and certain medications will be given to treat irritable bowel disease. I wanted to take a moment to say thank you for supporting the podcast. The Living Healthy Podcast is listed on many platforms, including Anchor, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Bullhorn, and many others. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. And don't forget to check out the Living Healthy Podcast channel on YouTube. Also, if you have any questions or would like me to discuss a particular topic or you'd like to be a guest on the show, please contact me at livinghealthylivinghealthy at gmail.com. Monoclonal gammopathy is a condition caused by proteins or abnormal antibodies in the blood. Doctors are not exactly sure what causes this to happen, but it's thought to be brought on by a really bad infection or exposure to toxins in the environment. Depending on the level of this protein that you have in your blood, 
this condition could open the door to more serious and life-threatening conditions. Generally, you'll be okay and it will not cause anything to happen. However, if you have a large amount of this protein, your doctor may recommend getting your levels checked often. A high amount of monoclonal gammopathy can lead to blood cancers like leukemia. Symptoms of this condition are anemia, neuropathy, fatigue, joint pain, and uncontrolled bleeding. More serious conditions are multiple myeloma, leukemia, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. As I stated earlier, this condition is monitored if you have a high level of the protein in your blood. Treatment only involves treating the blood cancer that develops, if it gets that far. This leads me to the next portion of blood disorders. Blood cancers. Leukemia is one of the most common types of cancers, and there are several types. However, for simplicity and time constraints, I'm going to talk about leukemia as it is a class of cancers. This occurs when the bone marrow creates abnormal white blood cells. What makes leukemia or blood cancers in general so dangerous, as malignant cancer is, is that this cancer is of the blood as well as of the bone marrow and it does not form a mass as other types of cancer in the organs or other tissues. Leukemia can spread throughout the body. This happens when there is a genetic mutation or abnormality that causes a change in how white blood cells are produced. It can happen in children, but mostly happens in adults 50 years and older. The Cleveland Clinic states that men are more likely to have leukemia than women, and that it accounts for 3.5% of cancers in the United States annually. Leukemia can be genetic as it has been found in families. However, doctors and scientists are not sure what actually causes it, since it does not form a mass like other cancers typically do. It's usually diagnosed through blood tests once a person complains about symptoms when other testing has not found a cause for the symptoms. A bone marrow biopsy, which is very painful, is also a way to diagnose this condition. Symptoms include flu-like symptoms, fatigue, dizziness, bruising easily, shortness of breath, and pain all over. Treatments include chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and stem cell transplant. Leukemia typically has a five-year survival rate once diagnosed. However, that prognosis is not for everyone. Some live shorter lives than that, and others can live longer. It all depends on other factors which involve overall health. Multiple myeloma is a cancer of the plasma cells, aka white blood cells. Normally, antibodies are formed that help your immune system to fight off infection. But when a person has multiple myeloma, these cells produce an abnormal protein known as a paraprotein or antibody. It continues to multiply and eventually inhibits the production of healthy cells. This protein spreads from the bone marrow to the blood and to the organs. This protein weakens bones and organs as it spreads throughout the body. Symptoms include fatigue, weakness, bone pain, kidney problems, thirst, constipation, and shortness of breath. Ultimately, it results in opening a gateway to other types of infections due to the immune system's inability to properly function. A person may be anemic or have kidney problems, and upon treatment for those disorders, multiple myeloma may be discovered. Multiple myeloma, although rare, has a tendency to run in families. As with leukemia, men are more likely to develop multiple myeloma. There may be a link to being exposed to industrial chemicals or toxins in the environment. Treatments include bone marrow transplants, immunotherapy, chemotherapy, and corticosteroids. Depending on the stage of multiple myeloma, a person can live anywhere from two to five years after being diagnosed. Polycythemia vera is from a class of blood cancers called myeloproliferative neoplasms. This occurs when your body makes too many red blood cells. When this happens, it can result in blood clots forming. This is very dangerous as it can result in a stroke or heart attack. As with leukemia and multiple myeloma, men tend to get this disease more often than women. This occurs as a genetic change takes place in the bone marrow regarding red blood cell production. As with most blood disorders, doctors are not sure of the cause, but conditions like diabetes, 
high blood pressure, and smoking are gateways to developing this disorder. Doctors have narrowed down this condition as being acquired and not genetic. Symptoms include headaches, fatigue, itching, especially after showering, shortness of breath, joint pain, blushing, and neuropathy. Treatments include phlebotomy, similar to the blood donation process. Other treatments include drugs like ruxolitinib, which can reduce red blood cells. Hodgkin's lymphoma occurs when white blood cells called lymphocytes grow out of control, causing the lymph nodes throughout the body to swell. The lymphatic system does its job in order to work with the immune system to filter out toxins, viruses, and bacteria. The lymphocytes continue to multiply, overcrowd, and form masses preventing healthy cells from doing their job. Symptoms include swollen lymph nodes all over the body, particularly in the armpit and growing area, fevers, chills, unexplained weight loss, itchy skin, night sweats, abdominal pain, and increased risk for infections. This disease can be linked to inheritance, environmental factors, as well as infection. Treatments are chemotherapy, radiation therapy, stem cell transplant, as well as surgery to remove certain lymph nodes. In addition, immunotherapy, where substances from the body or genetically modified substances are used to help fight the cancer. There are four stages, as there are with most cancers, and there is typically a five-year survival rate once you've been diagnosed. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma involves cancer that grows out of control, as in Hodgkin's lymphoma. The difference is the type of lymphocyte involved. Hodgkin's lymphoma is categorized by having Reed-Sternberg cells. They are large lymphocytes that have more than one nucleus, and they produce a particular type of cytokine. Symptoms and treatments are the same as with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Plasmacytoma is a cancer of the plasma that has a propensity to develop into multiple myeloma. It's actually a tumor that resides inside of the bone, but can also form in soft tissue. Doctors do not know what causes this condition, but airborne and environmental toxins are thought to play a role. Symptoms include bone pain, joint pain, fractures, fatigue, malaise, night sweats, dysphagia, and shortness of breath. Treatments include radiation therapy, immunotherapy, and chemotherapy. Foods that improve blood count. Depending on your condition, there are certain foods that can help to improve your red blood cell count. They include high-protein foods such as beef, turkey, lean chicken, as well as dark leafy greens such as collard greens, kale, and spinach. Other foods include legumes and nuts. Exercise and activity. Exercise is always beneficial, and with certain blood disorders, whether it be anemia or cancer, it's still good to exercise in conjunction with eating healthy. You have to exercise at least two days a week instead of three to four. You can also have fewer reps in order to not overdo it. You can still produce iron, but be aware that high intensity workouts may not be optimal as you can lose iron utilizing high intensity workouts, which would end up making it worse. If you're not able to exercise at home or at the gym, then take a walk around your neighborhood or use the steps instead of the elevator. Every little bit counts. Other things that you can do. You can research your condition. Try to stay up to date on things. We are in a day and age of the internet, and there's so much information that is literally at your fingertips. Not only will it keep you better informed to understand your condition, but you'll be able to talk to your doctor about certain things and you'll be more on top of your condition as it changes, hopefully for the better. This includes looking at medications, as some side effects are worse than the actual illness and you don't want to make your condition worse. Or worse yet, take a medication that gives you a bad side effect and then take another medication to counteract that side effect. Some medications are absolutely necessary, and the benefit of your life and extending your life will be worth it. However, some medications can build up in your body and can initiate other problems. You can also research holistic and natural medicines to use in conjunction with your doctor's treatment plan. 
make sure to discuss this with your GP and your hematologist. In the description of this podcast, I've listed a few links that have some additional information on blood disorders. Please feel free to check those out and share them if you like to. That's going to do it for part two of this two-part podcast. I want to thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. And I'll see you next time. Remember, living healthy creates a better you.